and she is a registered dietitian. Also, I feel like the more common language would be to say nutritionist. Yeah. Um, but she is in charge of the amazing website shirard.com. She has a fantastic Instagram. Oh, thank you. It's very true. And today I'm really excited because we basically are going to be asking her sort of the, I guess, all the questions that I've heard pop up once I have um, that you've always wanted to ask a nutritionist. So if you have any other questions that we didn't touch on today, please ask them in the comments and we'll get to it a second time. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So I, okay, I wrote all of them on my phone. I promise I'm not texting. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's pretty rude. It is like, it's pretty just, rude. Sorry, one moment. Hold on. <laughs> so, first. And let me take us out. Hold on, this is just. <laughs> um, so, first question is what is a registered dietitian? So, basically, traditionally, registered dietitians were basically you're trained clinically, you study biochem, organic chemistry, physiology, and you do a residency in a hospital. And you basically learn the clinical side of nutrition, where that plays in. Um, that's still true today, and that's what I did. I did my residency at Mount Sinai in New York and trained in biochem, organic chemistry. Um, but also traditionally, nutritionists were kind of like the food police. Right. And they would recommend things like um, rice cakes and low-fat cheese. Mm -hmm. And that's so the opposite of the way I operate. I really do feel like at the most basic level, nutrition or food is really nourishment and also pleasure mm -hmm. and I feel like that's kind of lost in the traditional sense of what it is it's really just about how to fuel your body and I really don't think that you can live a happy life yeah. if you don't enjoy food. I think then moving on to the next question I mean this kind of is all stuff that honestly I feel like there's so much bad information out there that a lot of it is just trying to get some clarification so this happens um, anytime I post a gluten-free recipe there's some like quite a bit of controversy in the comments I noticed because some people um, think that gluten-free is inherently healthier, others mm -hmm. disagree. So I wanted to ask, is gluten-free inherently healthier and sort of because it is a recent food trend? Mm -hmm. It's such a good question because it literally isn't going anywhere mm -hmm. and people ask me about it all the time. Basically, I mean, gluten is the research has shown that for a lot of people, it can be an inflammatory protein, which mm -hmm. means that it can cause some inflammation in your gut, um, which can translate to a little inflammation in the body. That being said, there's so many people that aren't sensitive to it. So the answer is no, I don't think that gluten-free is inherently healthier. Mm -hmm. And I think the big myth is that like, oh, if it's gluten-free, it must be healthy. Yeah, that's so, incorrect because what happens is, I mean, all these brands have jumped on this bandwagon mm -hmm. of having like gluten-free at the top and it's like these cookies and crackers and whatever mm -hmm. that it doesn't mean that they're healthy. It just means that they're free of gluten. And a lot of times, and we were talking about this before, mm -hmm. that gluten is a structural protein in baked goods. And so when you take it out, there's some structural kind of textural issues that happen. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, a lot of times gluten-free products have more kind of oil or sometimes sugar to kind of make up for the textural stuff. It just means that you really have to look at the ingredients. I think too that people think that, oh, if I go gluten-free, that means that I have to cut all this stuff out. And what's interesting is uh, where gluten kind of um, appears in the marketplace it's actually true. If you did cut a lot of those products out, most of it's processed food. Right. So 100%. Yeah. If you cut out all processed food, you're going to be healthier. Exactly. But gluten isn't the reason why. Right. You're instead of having all these processed foods, you're eating more things that have maybe five, four ingredients. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. And you're going to feel better and probably look better. Yeah. So it's like, I feel like people are acting as if gluten's the smoking gun. A hundred percent. And it's like, that's not, that's not what it is. Um, let's see. Oh, is raw inherently healthier? And what about like the issues surrounding pasteurization? So raw is an interesting thing because it's basically a community. Mm -hmm. um, and what you basically, the reason why it exists and why people believe in it so much is the thought that, you know, when you're cooking something mm -hmm. at a really high temperature, um, so nutrients are lost and some nutrients are lost, that's true. Um, and then the thought alternatively or in coordination with that is really that like 
then because it's raw and it hasn't been cooked, that the body absorbs it better. And so it's more like efficient use of nutrients. I really do feel like personally, mm -hmm. it's really hard on a lot of people's stomachs to digest. And then with um, pasteurization is really interesting because yes, some of the nutrients are definitely lost mm -hmm. in the process of heating it up. Um, but with that being said, you know, one of the reasons why it's so widely done is that it really does kill bacteria that can be really dangerous. Well, I mean, pasteurization, for those of you guys who aren't familiar, it's the practice of, um, you can do this with a lot of different types of foodstuffs, but classically it's milk mm -hmm. and it's a way to kill bacteria and milk. And basically once they started using pasteurization in mortality rates in cities like New York, like this is in the 1800s, um, plummeted. You know, it has a, yeah. it had a massive effect on the population. And so it's a way of allowing people who, you know, can't get fresh, beautiful milk, it's pasteurizing it, it kills that bad bacteria. Right. But in Europe, for instance, like French cheese is made with raw milk. And so that's where you get a lot of that like funky, stinky, really interesting mm -hmm. kind of flavor. So there is sort of a, I guess it's like two sides of the coin. It's like, we were talking about how for pregnant ladies. Right, exactly. For someone that's pregnant or kind of like we the term is immunocompromised. So mm -hmm. if maybe if someone is battling cancer and is on chemo or someone like for a, a kid, definitely not. Yeah. Someone who's pregnant or nursing, I wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of like, I think it's an adult choice. Yes, it's definitely an adult choice. Yeah, but there's a reason why pasteurization. Yes, yes, because it really, it works. Yes. All right, cool. Oh, okay. What <laughs> is um, the new food pyramid? Because I remember this from grade school. Oh yeah, the like grain. It's like 90% bread. Yes. <laughs> we have come a long way. Indeed. From that pyramid. It's actually oh no longer a pyramid. Ah. Yeah. What is it? It's a plate. Ah. It's called my plate. It's basically, so here's the plate. The idea is that half of the plate, 50% is greens, mm -hmm. whether it's um, you know, roasted veggies or salad or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Twenty-five percent is like a, ideally a whole grain mm -hmm. um, or something like a sweet potato or beans, like a starch. Mm -hmm. And then the other twenty-five percent is like a protein. Ah, yeah. All right. So yeah, it's, we've come a long way. I That's mean, so much simpler. I know. Yeah. It's so much. I mean, I remember that up in like the cafeteria. Totally. Of, yeah. Yes, I remember that too. Yeah, I know. It's no longer a pyramid. That's really funny. All right. Um, oh, what is good bacteria and what is bad bacteria? So I'm super into bacteria or we call it flora. Um, the deal with bacteria in the gut is that you, the gut is basically an ecosystem mm. of bacteria. You have good, good bacteria, you have bad bacteria. And the deal is that the ecosystem of the gut really translates to the lining mm -hmm. of the GI tract, which is what absorbs the nutrients. Okay. So if that lining isn't healthy, even if you're eating really healthy foods, you may not be absorbing them really well. And what the research shows is that actually that lining and the GI integrity of the mucosal lining actually translates to overall immunity um, and inflammation and all of that. And so the good bacteria really help with maintaining that structural integrity of the mucosal lining. It's a lot of like uh, scientific jargon, but it basically... Yeah, I'm loving it. I it mean, sounds great. Thanks, girl. Yeah. Um, it's basically just making sure your GI tract is healthy and then it helps you absorb the nutrients better. So something like, and we actually just tried kombucha. I know. That's um, in another video. Yes. <laughs> um, so kombucha, kimchi, you know, Greek yogurt with that the like, um, you know, Faye, or there's another yeah. one with like- The probiotic. The probiotic in it. Mm -hmm. All of that is the good bacteria, um, which is just really healthy for kind of the gut, but it translates to overall health. I guess for the next question, juicing and souping, which is kind of like a version of juicing, are they actually healthy? Are they good for you? Or is it more of a fad? So juicing is really interesting because a lot of people love it and kind of like what we were saying about gluten-free, what happens is you have someone that's eating maybe processed food and drinking alcohol and soda and sugary food mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they're switching to just eating legitimately vegetables and fruits and then their skin glows and they feel amazing and all that and of course they do because they've basically displaced all of this processed stuff with um, produce which yeah. is amazing but I think that the juice craze has gotten out of control just because there's a couple really issue, there's a couple big issues I have with it. The first is that 
juices remove all the fiber and you need the fiber to control the blood glucose response. Mm -hmm. So if you have a big apple, there's so much sugar in it, but it also has the fiber in, um, in the peel. So you, instead of your blood sugar going, it kind of goes because of okay. the fiber. So the first is that it really, juicing removes the fiber. And then the second is that a lot of times juices have a lot of sugar. So they're mm -hmm. kind of throwing like an orange and an apple and a cup of blueberries and you wind up having so much more fruit than you would in a sitting. Yeah. And so you wind up having like a really low calorie day, really messing with your metabolism. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, like you're getting a ton of sugar and not a lot of fiber. So it's, it's really not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, the deal with souping is interesting because I actually, I'm not, not a fan of souping. Mm -hmm. I, I think souping can be done in a certain way can be really great because you know, especially if you're doing the soups kind of with a- Oh, an immersion blender? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You're preserving some of the fiber and you can also have fat. Like fat is really important in the diet. So you can have like avocado or oils and things like that. And so it's not just um, fruit and veggies. Totally. So I think again, with the soups, as long as they have enough calories and fiber, then I'm okay with it. Yeah. Well, I think too, the important thing is like, I actually really love juice, but as a snack. Yes. Like if I need something on the go, it's delicious, it's great. And, and the thing about detoxing is really that like your liver and your kidneys, that's their job. Right, you like, have organs. Right? Yeah, your organs help detox the body. Um, that being said, you know, I mean, definitely drinking a lot of water, eating really foods that are really nutrient dense and mm -hmm. mineral dense and all that, definitely help with all the body processes and help, I mean, drinking a lot of water is so important anyways, but kind of, you know, flushing out what's already in there. I mean, there's something, I think just the idea of kind of this detoxing, just because of the word of it, it's mm -hmm. become this kind of really unfortunate thing where people aren't eating real food. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, as we were talking about this earlier, the way that health and wellness is being presented in the media is you have so much information mm -hmm. and I think it's confusing and I think it makes people feel like, well, what's it going to be tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Or I'm already this far in this hole. I mean, it's already ruined. So like, how am I going to get out of it? And so, and just grabbing onto straws. And I think that it's unfortunate because it's really not that complicated. It's mm -hmm. about eating really high quality, nutrient rich, flavorful foods that you're actually really enjoying. Yeah, well, I think I think that's the problem is that people want an option that is either you know inexpensive or an option that is very fast. Yeah. And the problem is that the truth is it's neither because there's a lot of things that are challenging. Luckily, well, we both are affiliates with Thrive Market, so yeah, there go Thrive. Yeah, we'll include a link there, but so that's a great way to get basically wholesale pricing on amazing, you know, um, sort of I guess I'd say health-driven yep. um, food and ingredients. But in, for the larger population out there, it's really hard to get access. And then on top of it, you know, it isn't fast. It's the yes. opposite of fast. It's slow. Mm -hmm. It's about lifestyle and it's about incremental small changes that right. make a big impact over time. Right. And I think that, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. And that's mm -hmm. such a big misconception that, and I think that can be really overwhelming and mm -hmm. kind of starting somewhere yeah. is kind of the way I like to look at it. I really consider my practice almost like food therapy mm -hmm. because it's really, I, I find that for most people that I work with, they know what to do more or less, they're just not doing it. And it's not because they don't care because they're not motivated, none of that. It's because life gets in the way yeah. and you're, you know, you're starting off your day and you're running to get something and like you don't really have a big breakfast and then you get to lunch and it's late and you're starving and then you overeat and then you're so mad at yourself but it's already ruined yeah. and then, you know, there's so many different reasons. It's so psychological. So psychological. I know for me, it's like if I'm doing really well, like I'm working out regularly and I've been eating pretty well and then I notice I jump on the scale and it's like, oh, I'm down a little. Yep. I have this idiot moment of like, oh, well like I'm invincible. Yes. This is great. I'm to treat myself and then I go too big and then I get bummed out that I went too big and then I just keep eating. It's, just, it's like an emotional roller coaster. Be aware of, of what that goal means. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as you approach it, just kind of being aware that it may be kind of scary in a way. Yeah. And it might cause you to like 
I can understand. I mean, I've never gotten that close, but <laughs> if I, you know, got to what my goal weight was, I would be, I would get overconfident and then go on like a big weekend bender and yeah. eat like 50 ice cream sundaes because I felt so good about myself and then be like, oh, you're like, yeah, yeah. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I think that just kind of, and I always talk about this with clients, like, you know, you'll, you may take a step forward and a little step back. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of, that's like, okay. Yeah, it is okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're getting to the two, I think, the two big questions. Mm. What is the most dangerous health myth out right now? Hmm. I saw the sign um, the other day on Instagram or something mm. that said the 80s called they want their low fat <laughs> cheese back or dairy back. It's like, eat the yolk, eat the avocado, mm -hmm. get the 2%, and enjoy it because it, it's, it's so good and I think it's kind of what we plays into what we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier about I think yeah having like an egg white omelet omelet with salsa and like a rice cake sounds so it's gross. Just, it's like if you're doing it for like a day okay but you just for that to be what you do every day. Yeah and how are you going to enjoy I mean actually eating it and having it be the yolk and feeling that kind of mouthfeel and the mm -hmm. unctuous I mean that's so good and it it really does allow you to just move forward. And you're like, I'm not thinking about food anymore because I just ate and it was amazing. All right, well, I think we've reached the final question of this first mm. round, but this was so fun. Seriously, if you guys have any additional questions to ask a bona fide nutritionist, <laughs> I'm learning so much. Yeah. This is so fun. This is really fun for me too. Yeah, like ask them in the comments do and it. we'll do this again. And this is great. And if anything, like you want more clarification yes. or a more in-depth response, like, yeah, like ask and we'll deliver. We'll yeah, do more. 100%. All right, so last question. How do you separate health fact from fiction? Hmm. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to look at if you're reading like an article is like, is this based in a study? And a lot of times you can click on that and be like, who is, what was this study on? Mm -hmm. Was this on animals? Was this taken out of proportion? All these things, because a lot of times people will take like a little piece of something and make it into this whole bigger thing where it's like, people who eat breakfast live longer. Yes. And I mean, yeah, it is good to eat breakfast. It starts your metabolism and stuff like that, but I'm also a realist. Someone hasn't eaten breakfast in like 30 mm. years. I'm probably not gonna start there. That doesn't really make sense. Like let's start somewhere that's like more realistic. That's interesting because I saw a really funny, um, sort of like a illustration online where it started with scientific study um, correlates that A and B may be related yeah. under certain circumstances. Right. And then it says, um, scientific magazine says, A and B may be correlated, exciting news. And then like mainstream media says, a makes B happen every time. And right. so it's this thing where right. you, when you see it filter through, it actually, the real truth to the story might be something a lot more nuanced, yes. a lot more complicated, and nowhere near as interesting. Exactly, yeah. and that's why you know people try and make it buzzy and all these things. And, and I struggle with that too, because I write for different magazines and outlets and stuff like that, and they're always kind of looking for the crazy salacious story about it and sometimes it's not that crazy it's just that you know one study found that something may be connected to something else mm -hmm. in science it's really really hard to prove something causes something yes and the reality is is that's even harder with diet and lifestyle because there are so many things that factor into it so oh. To answer your question, I feel like the biggest thing is if you're reading something, really kind of look at what you're at, like who's saying it, are they, you know, a legit scientific person, and look at what it's based on, and also with packaging, read the label. I mean, there's all these crazy, I mean, even with a lot of the stuff, because we kind of were tasting some stuff earlier, yeah. there's so many different claims and stuff, but if you look on the back, the ingredients have to be listed in how much of them are mm -hmm. in the product. So if there's so many ingredients and you can't pronounce them, even if it says, you know, it will make your skin glow and it's gluten-free and all this stuff, it's probably not really that good for you. I mean, something like people are always like, what's a great workout snack? And they wanna know like, what's my favorite bar and stuff like that. And I'm like, a date, some, 
cashews, like a handful of nuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's like not even that sexy. Um, but you know, that's what it is. I think that's interesting. It seems like the truth when it comes to health is usually a lot more common sense. It's probably something you already know mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's probably just whatever is simplest and the least refined and whatever's had the least amount done to it. And it is more complicated if you are kind of in a place that doesn't have a lot of options, but it's, you know, trust your gut and your instincts too, because a lot of times if you're reading something and it seems kind of funky, it probably is. Yeah. Too good to be true is a phrase for a reason. Yeah. Awesome. It also sounds like avoid the internet. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the internet's amazing, but there's, you know, there's too much information and I think it makes it confusing and it waters down the real information. And I think a lot of times the real information isn't as like Exciting. buzzy. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, this was amazing. This was so much fun. I learned so much. I'm sure everyone else did as well. I hope this so. was so fun. And please make sure to check out Shira's website, shirard.com, and her awesome Instagram. All the info is going to be below. But this was great. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Fun. This was amazing. All right. Well, bye, guys. Bye. We'll talk to you later.